be what a very, very sad day as Chris and Connie, the parents of Charlie Gard, announce on the steps of the High Court that they are withdrawing the application to take little Charlie off to the USA to have treatment. And I will say quite a lot more about that later on in the show. Uh, but for now, well, middle of last week, I heard a news report that Lord Pryor, a junior trade minister, had spoken behind closed doors to a group of tech and insurance industry executives. And it was leaked that he told them it was going to be the softest of all soft Brexits. There'd be hardly any barriers to entry and they didn't need not worry about getting future employees from the European Union. I thought, wow, this really is a break. After all, Theresa May, our Prime Minister, constantly says Brexit means Brexit. And she's just been re-elected, well, just about re-elected, on a manifesto that said she'd reduce net migration to tens of thousands a year. So I thought to myself, well, this prior fella, he's completely out of step. All right, he's got his friends in the Cabinet, like Mr Hammond, the Chancellor, but surely the Prime Minister can't put up with this. It's way too much of a breach of official government policy. I thought perhaps she'd sack him. And then I find that Michael Gove, that's right, he who advocated an Australian po style point system during the campaign, and Michael Gove is talking about transitional arrangements, namely the borders staying open for EU citizens for a minimum, minimum of two years after Brexit and perhaps even four years or who knows beyond that. And even Michael Gove says, I think the judgment we need to make about future migration policy should be shaped by what's in the interests of our economy. Goodness me, aren't these the arguments that were being used by the Remain camp during the referendum? Didn't we vote on this? Didn't we say we want control? Well, now there is a cabinet consensus. They are all united around transitional arrangements. And at now, at a minimum, it will be four years and nine months from the date of which we voted Brexit to when there's even the prospect of us getting back border controls with 450 million people who live within the European Union. Has the great Brexit betrayal begun? That's the question I'm asking you. And if you feel that you've been let down like a cheap pair of braces, then call me on 0345 6060 973. Or perhaps you think this is the right pragmatic way for us to go, in which case text on 84850. You can, of course, tweet Farage and LBC at LBC and say pretty much what you want. And you can watch me live on Facebook right now here from LBC Studios in London. So come on. Tell me what you think. I don't like it one little bit. This is a very serious backslide indeed. And the fact there is a consensus and that all the newspapers who back Brexit, who were screaming out about border controls, about the impact on schools and hospitals and train services and traffic on the roads and everything from a rising population are now all united in saying, isn't it wonderful that peace has broken out within the Cabinet, and that there is a consensus. Well, I'm not against consensus, but it strikes me this is the wrong consensus. I'm going to go straight to Michael in Waltham Abbey. Michael, good evening. A very, very good evening to you, Nigel. Pleasure to speak to you. So, you know transitional, <laughs> transitional arrangements, Michael, open borders for a minimum of two years. Is this what people voted for in the referendum? I think that most people who voted out, and when I voted out, I knew it meant customs union out yep. and single market out, because it quite clearly said so. I think all the people that voted for that have all been let down, and I think we all knew that this would happen. Unlike most politicians, with the exception of yourself, they haven't got the nows to realise that the majority of people out there voting them in are more or less far more intelligent than they are. And I am absolutely furious that this has happened but i knew it was going to happen and the consequence of this means that you know i will never ever vote again because so this is so for you sorry. this is for you this represents a real letdown for you of the whole democratic process yeah absolutely and what i'm really cross about is the fact that 
they used the fact that the economy will suffer. Well, I didn't vote for Brexit because of the economy. I voted for Brexit purely on a personal um, ambition to try and get control of our borders, some sort of normality back. OK, nothing to do with the uh, economy because they keep saying free trade. We're going to lose free trade, the biggest market that we've got access to, only because we're not allowed to trade anywhere else. Well, the, well, well, the only reason it... <laughs> well, Michael, we're allowed to trade wherever we like. The question is, on what terms can we trade? And the fact it's is... EU terms. You know, the fact is that as EU members, we've been forbidden from making our own trade relationships with other parts of the world. Um, but, Michael, what... I mean, what about the argument? What about the argument? Well, OK, but actually, if we do end free movement, the economy could fall off a cliff. Do you believe people when they tell you that? I believe we should we should just walk away from it because I know that you know come the eleventh hour things will change. It's, it's any kind of bargaining position. The minute one party walks away and the other party knows they're going to be hurt from the other one walking away, there'll always be a compromise. People that do this day in day out for their jobs every day, you know, from a car dealer to a banker. It's absurd to think that at such an early stage of negotiation, you're going to get a deal that you want. You walk away now and then you wait and, you know, 23 months into the two year period, something will start happening. Because if they know the Brits are strong and they're going to walk away from it, then, you know, and they well, clearly, payments. Michael, clearly they're going for tariff free access. That's what they're going for. Um, and that's fine. But it depends. What are they prepared to give up for it? Are they, clearly, they're prepared to continue with free movement for a minimum of two years. Perhaps they're prepared to pay a quite big bill as well. I don't know, Michael, uh, but like you, um, I, I think there may be millions of people like you, Michael, many of whom might have voted for the first time ever in that referendum, who are now feeling the system sucks just a little bit. Michael, thank you. Zach in Shenley. Good evening, Zach. Hi. 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 So have, Hi. They, Hi. have they got it right with this, Zach? Um, yeah, I think they have. I think it's a pragmatic move, as you said it was. I mean, um, let's, it's, it's representative democracy, so we elect these experts, these fiscal officials, as a people, to do our whim. I mean, the referendum wasn't binding, so I think we know that. I think everyone knew that Brexit didn't mean straight away leaving, leaving the EU. It meant, like, a series of negotiations in which we get the best deal possible for our country. Well, and I accept that, Zach. Vote, I accept that. You know, we weren't going to vote Brexit on June 23rd and it all be done and dusted by tea time on the 24th. Yeah. I get that. But, but, but the point I'm making is that by announcing these transitional arrangements, it will be at a minimum nearly five years from voting Brexit until we take back some degree of control on our borders with the European Union. Surely, Zach, that's not good enough. Well, of course, essentially it is election suicide for Conservatives. But that's not the issue. The issue is that we're never going to have our way with this. We're not as important and significant we think as we think we are. Are we? I, I, I think no. I don't think we are. I think we're we're. Like, I'm, I mean, Germany probably have more sway in the EU than we do because they're they're a much larger economy than we are. So I, to, to go in there all guns blazing, demanding this, demanding that, it's ridiculous. I think it's setting realistic expectations, such as a limiting on freedom of movement, yet still maintaining access to the single market and paying our fees. <laughs> Is, is, is a fair, is but, a fair deal. It's a fair Zach, negotiation. But, Zach, nowhere else in the world do people have to have free movement and pay big membership fees just to do tariff-free business with each other. Is, 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 that, a, is that a bad thing? Is, is recruiting other countries' um, individuals who can potentially provide our economy with services a bad thing? Well, Zach, I, I, look, no, 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 I'm all for us being selective. I'm all for us having a skilled migration policy, but I'm for us having control. And I'm conscious, Zach, that the British population is rising very rapidly. There are still chronic problems in many parts of the Eurozone, not to mention a migrant crisis that is politically you, tearing you, you're Europe just, to bits. You're just, you're just spouting rhetoric now. You're not really saying anything. Well, I tell you what, it's, 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 I, well, I tell you what, Zach, in Italy, in Italy, the migrant crisis crisis is now the worst it's been at any point over the course of the last few years. Do you agree with that? It, it, it was absolutely the Mediterranean crisis or the... Um, the Mediterranean crisis, you know, and that is happening in Italy, where well, you... Th it, it, you know, essentially, we caused this crisis by you know, bombing Iraq and Afghanistan in 2003, 2001, and causing the outbreak in the Middle East. But that's going to be a different issue. 
Well, we can't. I, I, I don't think. I don't think. I don't think. But, the but with forty percent, the EU when most of the immigrants coming in are from non-EU countries. Well, well, it's about half and half, actually, Zach, isn't it? That's roughly where we are with the numbers. All I'm saying to you is that with this policy, you know, on on current rates, you're looking at an extra, let's say, let, let, let's minimum an extra half a million people that will come in and settle in Britain during where this period of time. From? Well, last year, about 170,000 people from the EU settled in the so United so Kingdom. It's, so it's, so if it's, it's a five-year period, if, if it's a five-year period, I accept my figure's way too low. It may well be near a million, but if the Eurozone goes bang, it could be a million and a half. Zach, you clearly are a Remainer. All I'm saying to you is surely aren't the government breaking faith with Brexit voters by going for a transitional arrangement and open borders for a further two years? Um, well, you're putting me in a position where I'm going to have to say yes. Yes, yeah. they are. But, but yeah. I, I'm, I'm not, you know what, like, I'm not too fussed with that because I okay. know at the end of the day, legally, a referendum isn't binding. And I do I do believe in, in, in some manner that they do have our best interests at heart, the politicians. And essentially, they do realise that Brexit is harder than we initially thought it was during during the referendum. And, and we, we're, we're, not as, we're well, not as strong as we are. We're not as, as I tell you what, as Zach. I tell you I what, say, Zach. Can I say one thing? Sorry. Go on, quickly. Sorry, me. Um, you, you talk about the having skilled workers in our economy, but legally, according to European Union laws, um, if a worker does not find a job within three months of working it, they have to be um, they, they have a right to be deported or uh, when well, well, it's six months and it's never ever been enforced and it's never going to be Zach I'm going to have to let you go hi Nigel I like it very much and it's good for Europe too why concentrate only on what is good for the UK if Europe suffers as well says Robert Robert very interesting big group of German industrialists are now lobbying Angela Merkel saying for goodness sake give Britain a tariff free deal because that is very important for German industry the point folks I'm making is I want us to have tariff free access you know two ways with the European market, but we don't need to concede on free movement in you know to be able to do that. You're listening to the Nigel Farage show exclusively on LBC. It's 7:15. Peace at last. There is a cabinet consensus. There is unity in the British government. Doesn't it all sound fantastic? Fantastic. Yes, they've all gone with a line that really Philip Hammond's been pushing from the very start, which is that when we leave the European Union at the end of March 2019, there will be transitional arrangements and everybody is happy as Larry in that cabinet that free movement with the European Union will continue for a minimum of two years. But some reports suggest it could be four years. And I wonder, as the date gets nearer, whether it might become five or ten or forever. I don't know. Excuse uh, my cynicism, but it does seem to me that the issue upon which people voted in that referendum, above all, was the issue of taking back control of our borders. And interestingly, you know, polling out today where people are asked what are their priorities for Brexit, and this is both Remain voters and Leave voters, and top of the list comfortably is Britain to have full control over immigration policy. So I think people are being let down, frankly, virtually betrayed. Dave says to me, Nigel, these Remainers just don't get it. We are leaving, I hope. Fingers crossed. Well, quite a lot of us hope, I think. Uh, Paul says, well, Mr Farage, you could close the borders. You would close the borders, even if it destroys the economy. All you care about is getting your own way. No, Paul, I don't actually buy the economic argument anyway, because I think with the population going up as quickly as ours is, nobody has costed in what it, you know, what it is to build new hospitals, new bypasses, new schools. I don't buy the argument that open door immigration is good for the economy. Ah, good for big employers and good at keeping wages down, but not much else. Steve in Tunbridge, you're on LBC. How do you feel about this? Oh, hi there, Nigel. Um, well, I've got a um, bit of a gripe that I wanted to challenge you on, actually. Yep. But it, it, it relates to this topic. Um, l let's say if we fast forward to the next election, which is what I, I predict, that we wouldn't... We, I, I support Brexit, but I don't see us actually leaving the EU because there's too many politicians who actually want us to stay in the EU. I mean, the, the, the reason why um, uh, we, we won the Brexit debate is a bit like your, call, your previous callers. 
if you listen to them, it's all negative. There's no positive reason to stay in the EU. It's all, it's all about how bad it is if we leave. Yes. But my, my challenge to you, Nigel, is if we don't actually leave the EU, what can we actually do about it? Because I don't really think there's actually not anything we can do about it. Well, I think, t- uh, to begin with, I think there would be very large-scale public anger, much more, Steve, than anybody inside the confines of Westminster can even believe. Um, I, My experience is that if you took the sort of average passion level of a Leave voter against a Remain voter, it was much, much stronger, much more visceral on the Leave side. So anger, um, and that anger will manifest itself in some way. Um, and and by that I mean they will start voting again for different political parties. We'd seen a fragmentation to some degree of British politics, and what we saw in this election post-Brexit was a return to two-party politics. That could break very, very quickly if, as you, if your prediction that Brexit won't have happened by the next election comes true. I think you're wrong, Steve. I think Brexit will have happened. It's just that. If we stay with open borders and we stay paying a membership fee and and perhaps even the European Court of Justice having some say over our country, then in fact all we'll have is Brexit in name only, Steve. Well, I I still remain a bit sceptical because if you look at, the, for example, the war in Iraq, look at the millions of protesters and yet the government just said, uh, never mind, and yet they still want the election. I think... People, will, people vote tribally. It doesn't really matter too much what the arguments are. People actually believe that the Tories are conservative. I mean, that's amazing. <laughs> I mean. But, 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 Steve, that, in a sense, isn't that the beauty of a referendum on an issue? That people break away from their tribal allegiances. And even though the Labour leadership was saying vote remain, and the Tory leadership was saying vote remain, and the Lib Dem leadership was saying vote remain, actually, people did rebel in the referendum well, it, it may be, but I again, I, I, I just am a bit too pessimistic, but I, I just don't see it. I mean, look at the previous elections. People actually thought that the, the, the Tories were serious about bringing back grammar schools. Where's the pledge now? I mean, yeah, I know. Word, really. I know. So, I mean, Steve, yeah. do you vote at all? I mean, you, and you, you sound like you're the most disenchanted person I've ever met with the British political system. Do you still bother to go and vote on a Thursday evening? Well, my, my history... My record of voting was, I actually voted once for Labour until I got my very first paycheck and I saw how much tax I paid, and then I became a Conservative. <laughs> right. And ever since then, I, I've, I've been a Conservative. But then David Cameron put me off because he seemed more like a Liberal to me than a Conservative. So now I'm, uh, I'm sort of toying with UKIP, but I feel like UKIP has been infiltrated and is turning left as well. So I don't know. I'm sort of on the fence, really. Right. You want a proper Conservative Party, Steve. That's what you, you want. Margaret Thatcher to come back, Steve. Is that what you want? Well, kind of, yeah. Kind of. <laughs> Steve, I thank you for your call. Steve, who still votes, even though he thinks they're all lying to him, I'm going to let him down. Um, I am furious. Why can't May just do what she said she'd do? I want Jacob Rees-Mogg in. He would sort this out, says Terry on Twitter. Well, we managed to get 25 minutes tonight without Jacob Rees-Mogg's name coming up, but I knew that it would at some point. Sarah in Battersea. Good evening, Sarah. Hi, Nigel. So is it right and proper? Is it pragmatic and sensible? Is it good for the economy that free movement continues for a minimum of two years after we've left the EU? Well, thanks. I, I, I'd like to ask the question in a slightly different way and answer it in that way. OK. I, well, from my perspective, I would love for a hard Brexit to happen, not for the same reasons I do at all. I'd love for that to happen so that finally we could see the real consequences of some of your intentions and some of your goals. And what is a hard Brexit, Sarah? What does that mean? So, yeah, no, it's true. It means anything. I think it's the kind of Brexit that you have in mind. So no freedom of movement, no ECJ, ah, and so on. So you mean the Brexit, Brexit we voted Brexit. for, Sarah? Yes, in a way. I, exactly. Ah, thank I, you. So why do you call it hard Brexit? Why not call it democratic Brexit? Let's call it that way. Fine. I don't want to be into semantics, but okay. the reason why I want that to happen is so that we see what the consequences of all these actions would be. So you wouldn't be in the opposition how you've been all of your life, but you'd actually be in a position of power and you see what what happens when you take such decisions. I mean, you know, the world is fully globalized and integrated today. 
forget even the freedom of movement. Everything is in a global supply chain. You, you get out of the EU tomorrow without a deal, everything comes to a stop, and for the UK only. Well, hang on, hang on, Sarah. You're arguing that we're living in a globally interconnected world, and I'm arguing that perhaps the biggest benefit trade-wise of Brexit is that we're now free to re-engage fully with the 85% of the world economy okay. that isn't part of the okay. EU. Yeah, sure. I, I mean, I've heard that many times before from you and from others. I'll take one example. I work in, and I, I invest in Africa day in, day out. I work for a company that's invested billions in Africa. I can tell you now, so I know what I'm talking about. I can tell you the UK does not want to do trade deals with Africa for many, many reasons. One of them is, do you really think UK customers are going to want to buy Nigerian tomatoes? I mean, Nigeria imports all of its food already. What are they going to export food-wise? What, what, what exactly do you expect to trade with Africa? Well, Africa could sell us all sorts of agricultural products and cut flowers and all sorts of things. And it does sell some of those things into our market already, Sarah. But as you know, as an Africa expert, the EU does everything it can to make it really difficult for Africa to sell any of its produce into Europe. Africa, Africa imports the, the vast majority of its agricultural produce. They, they, they only make very small smallholder farming. That's the huge issue in Africa. So what is it that you want to trade with Africa? Well, is it people? I tell you what, I tell you what fish, fish would be a very good example, Sarah, um, of, a, of an industry... Uh, that Africa could and should be benefiting from um, in terms not just of catching but of processing and exporting. Uh, but as you well know, um, a lot of African fish is now caught by the European fleet. I'll give you another example. You, you mentioned trade deals with the rest of the world. How about India? Did you know that the Prime Minister of India did a tour of Europe? He came to Spain, he went to France, he went to Germany. Yep. This was two months ago, and it even come by the UK. So if the UK was so important, so relevant, wouldn't he have passed by the UK while he was in Europe? Well, perhaps the UK aren't very good at making people welcome. After all, President Trump has been all over Europe and still hasn't no, come to the, and still hasn't that come to the United Kingdom, that Sarah. That, well, he, that is not the reason why the President, Prime Minister of India didn't come to the UK. The reason why he did it is because... He can deal with a market of 500 million people or he can deal with a, with a country of 60 million people. Ah, but if you want to do a trade deal with the EU, be prepared. Don't, I mean, don't hold your breath because it might take seven or ten years. And there are countries, Sarah, all over the world, little countries like South Korea, Singapore, Chile, who actually put the EU to shame when it comes to negotiating trade deals. Sarah, we're never going to agree. You're a big pessimist about what you call a hard Brexit, but we did actually compromise and agree that it was a democratic... Brexit. I'm fed up with all these politicians trying to keep us in the EU. I voted Brexit, and that's what I want, says Linda. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It's 7.30. Well, it's transitional arrangements, and the Cabinet now has a great consensus around it, and what it means is that after Brexit, at the end of March 2019, free movement of people with the EU will continue for a minimum period of two years. And I'm asking you, has the great Brexit betrayal begun? A lot of people think it has. Others think, no, it's the pragmatic thing because of the economy. I'm not sure I buy into that, uh, but there we are. But the really big event today is, of course, that the parents of terminally ill baby Charlie Gard have now ended their legal fight over the 11-year-old's future. They've been trying, they've been trying actually for seven months to fly him out to the United States where there is a new pioneering therapy. Um, this was Chris Gard standing outside the High Court earlier on today. Our poor boy has been left to just lie in hospital without any treatment whilst lengthy court battles have been fought. Tragically, having had Charlie's medical notes reviewed by independent experts, we now know had Charlie been given the treatment sooner, he would have had the potential to be a normal, healthy little boy. Well, this is obviously a desperately sad day for both Chris and Connie, both of whom I met and both of whom I think to be absolutely sincere uh, people and parents doing their absolute best to try and give their child one last chance. Uh, and there are many things about this case that leave me deeply uneasy. Uh, the first being that in the hearing on Friday, the barrister representing Great Ormond Street read out in court evidence of a recent scan that showed further brain deterioration. And this was done before the parents had even been briefed on that report. And I found that quite extraordinary. And in response to that, Chris Gard shouted out at the barrister, you're evil. Well, who can blame him, you know, for, for that level of raised emotion? So I felt 
through the court proceedings that at times they were treated as if they were suspects when actually all they were trying to do was get permission to take their kid off to America to receive some new treatment. They may have had unrealistic expectations of what that treatment could give, but that is all they were trying to do, and I don't feel they've been treated well. Uh, I also feel uh, it's pretty clear that uh, baby Charlie Guard's condition has worsened during the period of this long, ongoing legal battle. And for the parents, the worst thing is they will ask that, and you've got a, there's a little hint of that in what Chris Gard just said. The worst of this is they will ask themselves for the rest of their lives what might have happened if we'd, give, if we'd actually had the opportunity to send our son at the start of the year to try this new treatment. But no, they weren't allowed because the establishment in this country closed ranks and denied them that opportunity. Which brings me on to the biggest question and the most concerning issue, I think, with this whole case. Um, and it isn't just about little Charlie Gard or his poor suffering parents, in, very important though they are in every way. It's about all of us. It's about what kind of society do we live in? Should we live in a society where parents, provided they're of sound mind, can make the ultimate choice about their children's future, or does the state have that power? And what this case has shown, sadly, is that the state has that power. I don't like it. I want this changed. I believe that parents have rights too, and not just the medical profession. And do you know something? The medical profession, for all the good work they do, they're not always right. I've seen instances in my life, my own life, where I was severely misdiagnosed 30 years ago. Doctors are not always right. Parents need the opportunity because medical science moves at different speeds all over the world. So I've, I view today as being a very sad day. If you've got some comments on that, please tweet me, Farage and LBC, at LBC, and I'll be very happy to read your comments out. Back to the issue that we're debating, which is this new cabinet consensus that has broken out. Everybody seems to be jolly happy. It's all wonderful. We can go off on our summer holes. A united government. We're going to continue. Open free movement of people with the EU for a minimum of two years. Perhaps it'll be four. Perhaps it'll be longer. I don't know. And I'm asking you, do you think the great Brexit betrayal has started. Liam says on Facebook, immigration is good, mass immigration is not. Well, Liam, that is what people voted for in the referendum. But if you have an open border, you can't control the numbers. And he says, how can it be five years? They will not be in power then, that's for sure. Well, Andy, the five-year point I'm making is that we voted Brexit in June 16. We're leaving in March 19, and we're being told for at least two years. So that's four years and nine months. And that is that is the most optimistic that I can possibly be at this moment in time. I doubt that it's even realistic. Ron, from the Isle of Sheppey. Ron, tell me, were you a Remain or a Leave voter? I was a Leave voter, Nigel, and good evening. Good evening, Ron. So you were a Leave voter, uh, and, and, and was immigration, was border control one of the issues that you voted on? Absolutely, 100%. I voted, which I thought was quite clear on the leaflet that came through the door. It was on the television and every programme in the media for weeks and weeks and weeks, wasn't it? Everyone understood, must have understood, what we was voting for. And I voted for the return of all powers to my government so that my vote would count. At the moment, I feel like it doesn't. So I want a return of all powers. This EU is, we can trade with Europe, not a problem. We can trade with everyone, not a problem. But I do not want, which I consider a corrupt EU, telling me and my people in my country, my family, what we can do and what we can't do. It's up to us to decide democratically in our own country what we do. I guess the counter-argument, Ron, and the argument I, I guess that Michael Gove and others would make is that we have to be pragmatic about this, that, that, that you know, Brexit is a decision that, that ultimately is forever, and if it takes us a bit longer to get there, 
what's the problem? And that is the pragmatic argument that they're going to put and that business won't be scared. Um, I guess, I guess, Ron, for me, when I listen to that being said to me, for me, the problem is that if it takes five years to get back control of our borders, that strikes me as being too long. Why wait too long? It's, it's a joke, isn't it? It's, it? What it is, it's a Remainer government that don't want to leave. And they're trying every... It seems to me, over the weeks and weeks that we've had this, it seems to be a drip, drip, drip thing. You've got the, you've got the BBC for one, and you've got all, <laughs> every newspaper media. It always seems to be a drip, drip, drip thing until they think they've got you in a position where you're actually going to believe what they're telling you. Well, and the, I don't believe them. That's the I odd thing, Ron. I mean, the odd thing is that all the Brexit newspapers who scream so loudly about open borders and the need for control are now backing this consensus. Ron, from the Isle of Sheppey, I thank you. Agreeing with Ron is Rose on Twitter. She says, I didn't vote for a transitional arrangement. I feel let down. I think quite a few people, Rose, are feeling let down. I wonder how Tony of Bounds Green feels. Good evening, Tony. Hello there, Nigel. Well, I'm, I've had myself tested for dyslexia recently, and I'm not making light of dyslexia, because I thought it was in or out. Right. But I've looked at it again, and it actually says in and out, if you looked at the vote. Right. I think what we've got here is the okie cokey option, rather than the soft and hard Brexit. And every time these people keep coming on respecting the referendum and then go on to deny the referendum, I think we should be playing that okie-cokie tune because yep. they're in and they're out and they're in and they're out. And the thing that you keep mentioning the minimum period, but you're yeah. not mentioning the maximum period. Well, no, well I have... Maybe I mean, it's 100 years. Well, I have. Sp uh, well, I, I wasn't going as far as 100, Tony, but I did say... <laughs> but it came back. Look, I don't know. I mean, to me, Tony, what's really going on here is the political class are having their way. The modern-style Tory party in Westminster has never been concerned about immigration. In fact, they find any discussion of it embarrassing. It means they and their wives don't get invited to the smart dinner parties with a Notting Hill set. It's socially unacceptable to talk about these things. But, and Nigel, Nigel, can I just say, I think yeah. you made a, a tragic mistake, which is quite touching in a way, because you, it shows you as being a bit of an idealist, in that you didn't realise that the day after the referendum, the referendum campaign hadn't ended. It continued ever since then, with only one side fighting it. And the incredible thing is, if I was organising a team to take on Everest, and everybody in my team was saying it couldn't be done and they get nosebleeds at, you know, at these sort of heights... You're talking about the modern day May cabinet. I mean, 17 out of the 26 on day one were Remainers. I know. I mean, I would, know. You would you tra take them with you on that mission? So I think the whole thing is disgusting. What worries me is that people who voted to leave will just give up and just say they, they, they can't find a way out of it. Yeah, I, I've of had, course, I'm getting sorry, a little bit a of a problem. sense of that, Tony, because a lot of people, a lot of people in that referendum did vote for the first time in their lives. And, if, and, and I remember people saying, gosh, I went out and voted for the first time ever and I was so excited, I felt I'd made a difference and changed the future of our country. And, Tony, you're right. Um, it, it will put people off voting, but it'll also make people pretty angry, won't it? But, well, it will, but the difficulty is it's a cross-party issue. I mean, people have forgotten that Enoch Powell and Anthony Wedgwood Ben were very much ideological sure. enemies, but were united on this. And you've had people like... Bob Crow and uh, people like yourself and Boris Johnson and so forth. It's a cross-party issue that can't get any cross-party momentum in the current system. And the idea that Theresa yeah. May was the answer to the Brexit problem is just so amusing, it's beyond words. But nope. uh, what I would say, Nigel, by the way, is keep going, and it's amazing that you can work through all the abuse that you've taken. <laughs> That's very kind of you, Tony. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I'm also welcoming other points of view. Tell me I'm wrong. Tell me, actually, that transitional arrangements are the right thing to do, are consistent with the referendum result, and that the Cabinet is doing the right thing. Please, please, come and tell me that. I'm all ears. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It's 7.45. Well, it's Brexit, unavoidably, and I feel the ground rules are shifting because we're now told under transitional arrangements there'll be open borders until at least 2021. At least 2021, which will be five years after we actually voted for it. Sue in Paddington, good evening. Hello, Nigel, nice to speak to you. Um, why do we keep allowing politicians and the business community to conflate free movement with work visas? We have nearly two years to implement a work visa system. 
I assume we haven't got the will or the wit to do that. But we don't need free movement. We need, you know, if we, if we need people to do those jobs, they can come in on work visas and they could be sponsored by the business community that up to date have passed the true cost of free movement onto the British taxpayer. So you're talking about a simple work permit system, much of which could be yeah. done online, Sue, yeah? Exactly, yeah. Why are you being so practical and pragmatic? <laughs> I'm sick of the whole thing, to be quite no, honest. You're absolutely uh, right. Look, so I think what everyone's forgetting is that there are 200 countries in the world that do control who comes into them and do operate, nearly all of them, a work visa stroke permit system of some kind. And the beauty, Sue, of your proposal, as you say is that it's the employer that has to sort it out. It's the employer that uh, has to make sure there is medical insurance, you know, for people working here during that period of time. Um, and presumably, it would be the employer who would apply to the state the individual's coming from to do criminal record checks and all the rest of it. I think you're right, Sue. There are there have been big beneficiaries of open-door immigration, big employer, big employers, and the rich, of course, because, you know, it, it's cheaper nannies, chauffeurs and gardeners. So I'm completely with you, um, but, but this is not what's being suggested. Uh, and actually, you know, we're looking at 2021 as being the nearest possible date at which a system such as the one you're suggesting could be put into place. Can I, can I just add something to that, Nigel? Please. Yeah, for some reason or other, our lily-livered politicians keep wanting to hand the psychological advantage to the 27. I mean, I don't understand it. That is just about the craziest way of going into negotiations, isn't it? You know, I, I'm not saying that, you know, we're the best, but I think they need us as much as we need them, I th if, if not more. Well, I mean, I would agree with that, but I think so. I think what this is all about is they want to get tariff-free access to the European single market. Politically, they feel that's what suits them at home. And don't forget that the relationship between the Tory party and many of the big businesses has been close over a long period of time. I can imagine there's intense lobbying going on behind the scene. And I think, Sue, in order to get that, they're prepared to give away an awful lot of other things. That's my view. Isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> that's my view. So do you feel let down, Sue? Do you feel <laughs> let down? Let down. I, I, I don't understand um, the business communities in the 27. Are they being sort of sat on by the politicians? Is, is, the, is the agenda sitting on, you know, the sensible heads of the business communities across the 27? No, I think it's the other way around, Sue. I think it's the big businesses sitting on the politicians and telling them what they should think. I think it's that way around. Sue, I thank you very much for your practical call. Billy says on Twitter, it took over 40 years to get to the position that we're in. Why should it take any less than 40 years to unwind it? Well, actually, you know, we should, we should, within two years, be able to sort all of this out. It is not beyond the wit of man. The EU are now trying to lengthen Brexit to give businesses time to adjust, says Declan. Well... Everybody is trying to give us time to adjust, but that is not what we voted for. Is it, Tet, who's calling me from Ealing? Good evening. <laughs> Good evening, Mr Farage. This is the first time he's spoken. Well, you're um, welcome. <laughs> we, we disagree on, I have to say, we disagree on virtually everything. I'm an well, that's all right. It's a, free, it's a free country, isn't it? Absolutely. Well, last time I looked. But here's the thing. <clears throat> These transitional arrangements yep. are happening for reasons I think the public don't understand. Now, you're a European insider. You worked at the European Parliament. You got a sense of how this whole thing pans out. But the people who um, uh, voted in the referendum, I'm certain, don't understand the complex linkages between tariff-free access, single market, immigration, defence... And the economy. Because, well, let, I mean, well, let's, let's just pick two of those. Let's just pick two of those, shall we? Why on earth, for tariff-free trade, do you need to have free movement of people? Well, that's really not a call for us to make. Those are the rules of that club. I know, but what I'm saying is that we voted to leave that club, and we're now looking for a new arrangement. 
And okay. I'm with you. You know, it would be much simpler to continue our current trading terms. That would make a lot of sense. But obviously, sure. the tr- but obviously the trade-off is money and free movement. But, t- I mean, I keep making this point, and no one's ever yeah. countered me. Nowhere else in the world does free trade mean you have to have free movement. But, but nowhere, in, nowhere else in the world do you have a trading block like the EC. I mean, this is a particular club. Mm-hmm. Every club has its rules. But, we, but, but yeah, yeah, but we're leaving it. wasn't set up for people to leave. But we're leaving. I mean, that, that is something that, yeah, okay. But, but the, their rules weren't set up to um, allow people to leave with ease. That's a fact I will acknowledge. Mm. I will also acknowledge that I'm filled with disquiet, even though I'm a strong Remainer, yep. about the creation of a European superstate. However, because it's a club, when you join the club, you have the power to manipulate it from the inside. If you're outside of that, we club, try, uh, te- you come have on, mate. No we power. spent we spent forty years with British prime ministers telling us they were going to reform it, and Mrs. Thatcher, at the height of her powers, failed. Blair, at his absolute peak, completely failed. Te- whether you like it or not, we have voted to leave, and it is yeah. becoming a super state. But I'm more concerned about something else, rather yeah. than what you think about this or I think about this. What yeah. about trust? What about democracy? What about the fact that people voted very clearly for Brexit, for taking back border controls, and now a Conservative-led government is extending that timetable? Surely that, with the democratic process... You do, please. Now, before I do that, I will give you one thing, is that the longer the transitional arrangements go forward, the more we enter a different phase, and people might change their minds. I'm very conscious of that. That's the first thing. The second thing is... Um, When people made the vote for the referendum, it was clear because the day after the referendum, do you know the biggest Google search term was? Well, Brexit. Country mile? Brexit, I'm sure, but, you know. What is the common market? Yeah, well, people didn't know. Ted, I'm going to have to let you go. You've had a fair old whack. I've got one more call. John in Newark, you're my last call of this evening. Good evening. Good evening, Nigel, and what a pleasure it is to talk to you. Welcome. My my goodness. Hey, on the 21st of June last year, we voted to depart from the four freedoms, OK? We did. And now, and what a celebration it was. It was like winning the lottery. <laughs> it, was, it was absolutely amazing. That's how I you know felt. It was, it, I was dumbfounded. I, I was shocked, happy, all at the same time. But now, as it's drawing out this next two years, they're going to draw out those four freedoms and they're going to attack it. It's going to be a war of attrition and they are going to pull everything out of the bag so that they get their four freedoms. Is the British government, John, is the British government making too many concessions too early in the process? Yeah, it's at the end of two years. If they've not made the deal, it's stop. Everything stops. Yeah. Yeah. All the four freedoms stop. If they want to trade with, it's fine. But there's, they, we shouldn't have to c- compromise with anything. If Mercedes wants to sell us tax free, and uh, you know, fine, let's do the trade. But we we don't we don't go. Oh, well, we'll get, you've got to say you know some some people from us. No, that's not the deal. Is the Tory-led government, John, letting us down? Is this the start? Is this some I kind of a trade? I can't believe it, Nigel. Voted Brexit, and we've got the Remainers. Leaving in the, the, the army. I what know. a load of rubbish that is. John, wonderful. Thank you. A point that I agree with, obviously, many will disagree with. Do you know, even the most hawkish of our cabinet ministers, Liam Fox, says it's OK to have these transitional arrangements and free movement as long as we sort it out by the general election of 2022. And that is the hard liner. And there'll be no limits on who can come between now and then. This is not what we voted for. The absolute maximum date when free movement ends should be the end of March 2019. But actually, I think we should name a date much earlier than that, after which people's rights simply aren't guaranteed. It's called Brexit. It's called democracy. It's what we voted for. You've been listening to The Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. I'm back tomorrow from seven. Coming up at ten, it's Ian Collins, but up next, it's Clive Bull. Nigel, thank you. At nine, the Consumer Hour. I'm joined by consumer lawyer Dean Dunham to answer your questions about your rights. Uh, Also...